All right, as we begin part three here, uh, we, in a sense, we're reverse engineering this, where we're coming back around and, and saying, okay, well, the <coughs> scriptural foundation, and again, I'm doing this, and I kind of, in the manuscript that I'm working towards publication, I do it kind of roughly the same way, skipping some steps that you, well, I've skipped some steps that you didn't get to see, uh, and we can have a conversation in Q&A to fill in some of those gaps, perhaps. Uh, but even that progresses in such a way where I'm wanting to end with that biblical foundation so that we have kind of removed, not entirely, and we're not disregarding the ed edifice of history, but saying, let's draw back to scripturally, where does this all come from? And how is it that we then move forward on the basis of what we see in scripture? Because I think there are times in which we are just as confused when we turn to Scripture to justify this as when we turn to our own church history to do so. So I think appropriate in order to do this, uh, I spent most of my time in digging through this, uh, looking in Acts chapter 6, which is we've spent all this uh, time referencing deacons. Uh, this should be no surprise that I'm heading this direction despite the fact that the term deacon never shows up in the chapter, but it seems, I think, fairly clear that that's what's being spoken of here, even though there is continuing debate uh, whether that is specifically what's being discussed. Uh, so reading uh, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews. You don't have complaints in your churches, right? This is just a thing of the past. <laughs> um, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas. Parme Parme <laughs> See, I even butcher these things. So everybody, be nice to your lay volunteers who read on Sunday mornings and just get those great passages and are wonderfully tongue-tied. Uh, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. What are we to do with the recounting of a story such as this? How is this narrative to inform the practice of the church in the 21st century? Well, first of all, Acts is narrative history. Luke is attempting to provide for Theophilus a well, as well as centuries of readers since his time, an orderly account of first what took place in the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, and second in the book we call Acts, an account of the growth and expansion of the early church through the ministry of the apostles. As a narrative, the passage under consideration ought to be given first as a recounting of what took place. Only once this is understood ought we attempt to derive principles for a modern day application from the text. One cannot simply reduce a story such as this to an argument that the church ought to have deacons today, that they are cast in the same form as those established by the apostles. You can't simply transfer and transplant what's happening here. The modern church ought to first learn how the early church responded to a crisis and secondarily, how a similar process might, might be employed to respond to a crisis, new crisis today. When considering passages from Pauline epistles on the qualifications for elders and deacons, it makes sense to take these lists as prescriptions on how to assess the qualifications of church leaders. However, what we see in Acts 6 
is a descriptive account of how the apostles responded to the concerns raised by the Hellenistic Jews. When considering how to treat a passage from Acts or any other narrative passage, it is important to keep in mind that unless there is an explicit instruction that gives an indication that the text is to be taken as normative, it is more appropriate to, to treat the passage as a narrative, that while it may inform our practice, it does not mandate in its structure. Some of you in my class, this will sound familiar. Thus, while examining Acts chapter 6, while there is much to consider when establishing or maintaining the practice of ministry in the church, the passage ought not to be taken as prescriptive, but rather as a description of what historically took place. The narrative of Acts 6 is a descriptive description of what took place, not a prescription for what offices are mandated for the church today. Much is made by some that the offices of the early church were defined rather than fluid. This argument seems to focus on ensuring that there is no confusion between the service provided by deacons and the ministry of the word of the apostles and those they ordained to follow them in that office. The latter work of Stephen and Philip is seen as either evidence that they were transitioned into another office or a personal non-public ministry performed beyond their diaconal duties. Interesting arguments. The claim that taking on a more pastoral role would not have been part of their office and citing a lack of biblical evidence makes sense up to a point. However, this is an argument that works both for and against these claims. The lack of biblical evidence that deacons were called to do more than handling food distribution is accompanied by a similar lack of discussion on such a restriction. We are simply told what they were commissioned to do. It might make better logical sense to argue that since there is no corresponding description of an expansion of those duties, that therefore there must not have been, but this stops short of being entirely certain. We are dealing with competing arguments from silence and a lot of ink is spilled over staking claim on what's not said. Not good place to be marking your territory. We have Luke's description of the call of the deacons along with his further description of the further ministry of Philip and Stephen. What we do not have is any direct explanation either way with respect to the nature of the authority by which they continued to serve the kingdom beyond the initial diaconal duties. Some further scriptural discussion. Paul in Ephesians 4.11 provides a list of offices from the early church. This list is at times argued to consist of a combination of offices no longer in existence today, apostle and prophet, and those of the modern pastor, the evangelist, the shepherd, and teacher. Above, it was pointed out that the modern understanding of the teacher, even the Lutheran teacher, ought not to be obfuscated in such a way as to claim that the teacher in Ephesians is the classroom teacher and that these are in some case somehow the same office. What's being discussed in this passage is not a teacher in that sense. There is, however, a way of looking at the text and not having to either equivocate between the two entirely while still upholding a, a single office of public ministry. In the case where a local congregation is served by a single man as pastor, the entire office of public ministry resides in his office as pastor. In the case where a teacher or other office bearer works alongside the pastor, that additional individual serves in a branch or helping office. This latter example does not take away from the pastoral office in any way, nor does it suggest that the work done by the bearer of the helping office is somehow less than that done by the pastor. The helping office may not be the sole bearer of the office of public ministry in the same way as the pastor may. 
The helping office ought always to seek to uplift the work done from the pastoral office. This is what Walter was getting at in the church and the office of the ministry. When he lists school teachers, among others, as ones, quote, which bear a part of the one church office. Interestingly, uh, F.C.D. Winnikin, second uh, president of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, saw something further in Ephesians 4.11. While much is made about the distinction between pastors and teachers, Winnikin focused on the role of evangelist. Going so far as to support the establishment of a called position for the Synod to support his passion for mission work in North America. While the L LCMS opted in convention not to establish a, such a position, that might have served as an additional office of ministry, offering support of the preaching office. Like the office of teacher, or modern, modern day, or ancient catechist, an office of evangelist would be a branch office of the pastoral or preaching office. Interestingly, in 1 Timothy, Paul provides an indication that not all elders are elders who preach. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. That's a subtle implication that slides by and I am thankful to some who have reviewed my work in this to say, hey, did you think about this? Nope, because it slides right by. It's the kind of thing you just, you miss it. But the implication is tucked in there that especially those that implies there are others who do not. Recalling that the biblical use of the term elder is more equivalent to the modern pastor than lay people serving as elders in the church today, this passage often goes unnoticed in this discussion. Paul distinguished between elders who rule, that is, exercise authority, and those who preach and teach. Once again, this does not mean that there is more than one office of public ministry. But it does provide further evidence that a proper understanding of this office is not exclusive to the office of the pastor. So trying to suggest a biblical model. Well, how do, what do we take all of this and what, do we, what shape do we put it in? Rather than seeing what took place in Acts 6 and other passages as a prescription for the number and type of offices that the church is to have today, and keeping in mind that the, descript, the descriptive nature of the passage, Luke is providing an example for the church to follow. When faced with circumstances where a pastor is in need of help in his ministry, other offices suited to provide that help may be established in a similar manner as it was described in Acts. The list of offices from the New Testament, along with the description of the manner in which the apostles established the office of deacon, does not limit, it instructs. The church throughout history, and even today, must at times adapt in order to best respond to the needs of ministry in the local church as well as in the larger church body. Just as the apostles established the office of deacon to allow them to focus on the preaching of the gospel, the LCMS has established commissioned ministry roles, and congregations call individuals in a similar fashion for a similar purpose. Luther held that the church had the authority to establish these new offices. Again, he states, we even read in Acts regarding an even lesser office, that the apostles were not permitted to institute persons as deacons without the knowledge and consent of the congregation. Rather, the congregation elected and called the seven deacons, and the apostles confirmed them. If then the apostles were not permitted to institute on their own authority, an office having to do only with the distribution of temporal food, how could we have dared to impose the highest office of preaching on anyone by their own power without the knowledge, will, and call of the congregation? Notice precisely where he's placing authority. The congregation, or, as, or in the sense we talk about the church as a church body, as a denomination, we make decisions together and say, there is a need. 
how shall we address this need? And so we institute and establish these branch offices. They are not lesser offices. They are not less divine. They are not less worthy of a call. They are, however, not equivalent to the pastoral office. And we can hold both of these things in tension. The establishment of deacons, though guided by the apostles, was done by the authority of the congregation assembled, not merely by the apostles. The structure and manner in which we organize those who serve in church ministry was not prescribed in total in the New Testament. The pastor is clearly identified and divinely established. <clears throat> The diaconate of the early church was established by the apostles through the guidance of the Holy Spirit and with the blessing of the church. You can have the bad joke here. Act 6, what takes place, the first voters meeting. It went fairly well. <laughs> the way in which deacons were selected and set aside by the laying on of hands gives a good indication that their work was seen as a public ministry. The apostles did not privately ask these seven to assist them, but rather placed them in public service to the body of Christ in Jerusalem. Using this model, the church has raised up new offices that branch off the office of public ministry to serve their own public ministry. Each In each new era in the church, necessitates a new look at how the church structures its ministry. The core, that is the one office of public ministry, remains and must remain. <laughs> but those offices that branch from it are an element of Christian liberty for the church to solemnly set aside. So finally, what is it that we have as a theology of commissioned ministry? The argument has been laid out that what took place in Act 6 should be taken as a description of those events rather than a prescription for how the church ought to approach the establishment in relationship to all other non-pastoral offices. Just as the apostles determined that the need was not being met, so the church today may at times establish new offices in order to respond to needs that may not best be handled by pastors. In larger congregations, there may exist not only the need for additional pastors, but for others who specialize in particular areas of ministry in support of the ministry of the pastor. The development of our Lutheran school system necessitates the formation of Lutheran teachers to support its educational ministry. While there are a good number of pastors who serve in part or in full in our LCMS schools, we set up special training for our teachers to meet the specific needs of this educational ministry. This has taken place in each case and in each area where a commissioned Office of Commission Ministry has been established. A case had to be made before the Senate in convention in order to argue for the necessity of each classification of worker to be creative. Be creative. <laughs> so what is a commissioned minister? The proposed answer to the question stated above could be phrased this way. The question could be phrased, how does the auxiliary nature of the office relate to the office of public ministry? This is where I began, I would say honestly in my own thinking, probably more than a couple of decades ago even, but in this research in the past year, I begin with this question. It can be found across the discussion of the office of public ministry throughout this lecture. However, it is right and good to provide specific clarity on this issue since that was the task of this work. Coming in and leaving you with an ambiguous answer would not be great at this point, right? <laughs> Borrowing a bit of philosophical language. Now outline the question this way. If the preaching office is coextensive with the pastoral office, then commissioned ministers are not within the office of public ministry. However, the church has the freedom to create other helping offices and can call people to them as public ministers in a derivative sense. If, on the other hand, the preaching office is not coextensive with the pastoral office, then we can understand commissioned ministers as being within 
public, the public ministry, but still in a helping sense, as the office of pastor is the only office within the public ministry which Christ specifically instituted and which is not optional for congregations. Drawing upon the understanding of Acts 6 and other passages put forth above, along with the review of Luther, the Lutheran Fathers, and the history of the Synod, it seems clear that the preaching office is not coextensive with the pastoral office. Commissioned ministers stand beside the preaching office in their own holy offices, they, which bear a part of the one church office, as stated by Walther. Lutheran teachers, DCEs, DCOs, DPMs, deaconesses, DFLMs, don't you love the LCMS alphabet soup, <laughs> and called lay ministers are not a part of the laity. Like the pastor, commissioned ministers are members of the priesthood of all believers called to serve in their various church vocations that have been established officially in convention by the LCMS. These holy offices are divine, not because Christ specifically ordained their creation or because they are mentioned directly in Scripture, but rather because their public ministry is a true part of the office of public ministry, and that was established by Christ. All right, that is the...